So as you'll recall, all of our uh, topics in Unit 11, the history of Southern and Eastern Asia, uh, fall under uh, Social Studies Standard SS7H3, Analyze Continuity and Change in Southern and Eastern Asia. So for topic one, and by the way, also topic two, we're gonna be using element D, describe the impact of communism in China in terms of Mao Zedong, the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution, and Tiananmen Square. So let's start with some background about China. So as you're aware, for a long time, China was ruled by emperors. In fact, you probably will remember from uh, other history classes hearing of different dynasties in China. During the 1800s, China was really controlled, sort of colonized by Europeans and other countries. By the way, the United States got in on that as well. Uh, this type of economic colonization that at the time they called spheres of influence. Now, in 1912, in 1912, the last Chinese emperor uh, is overthrown by uh, a, republic, a Republican government. And so for a brief period of time, China is legitimately a republic. Uh, but then not too long afterwards, a civil war breaks out between the nationalists on one side led by Chiang Kai-shek, that's that fellow over there in the top corner, and the communists led by this other guy over here, Mao Zedong. Ultimately, the communists end up winning this war and the nationalists flee to the island of Taiwan, where, by the way, they're still there. Uh, Mao Zedong now becomes the new dictator of communist China. So what is communism, you ask? Well, communism is not a type of government as a lot of people assume. It's actually a combination of both government and economic systems. So uh, econ economic system wise, uh, a co communism uses a pure command economy. Now we spent a lot of time talking about economic systems before, so you, you understand what that means. Uh, command economy can also be referred to as socialism. In terms of government, communist systems almost always use it, some form of dictatorship, although sometimes they can be oligarchic. So um, a little bit more background on this. You see, communism was really a reaction to uh, some capitalist um, abuses of the 1800s. In the 1800s, um, a lot of workers were mistreated. And so communism kind of arises as a, as a response to this. Uh, you probably saw in the videos about uh, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels discussing this. But essentially, uh, communists say that capitalism, that in capitalism, the workers end up being exploited and abused and left poor. And um, through this exploitation, business owners, they get rich but the workers get poor. And so in a communist system, the idea is that uh, in a communist system, the economy would serve the workers, not the wealthy business owners, by making everyone equal and sharing all the resources. And this sounds very attractive. It sounds like a really good idea. Uh, unfortunately though, it doesn't really work out that way. See, communism ultimately fails because communist countries end up being poor and the citizens end up being terribly oppressed with no rights. All right, on to topic two. Now we're still on, we're still on um, element D uh, and this one is the horrific history of Chinese communism. Now I know this is a fairly dramatic title I've given this topic, horrific history of Chinese, but Chinese kind, but really it's true. It's true. Um, what we have here are three major events in Chinese communism, and they were all horrible. These are all events that lead to people having fewer rights. They're all events that lead to the deaths of many, many people. They're horrific. So we're gonna start with the Great Leap Forward. So something to understand about China when the communists take over is that China was not industrialized back then. It's just not the China that we know of today. Uh, China in the late 40s and 1950s was a, a, an agrarian 
society. And the agrarian, of course, means that they're farming based. Uh, their economy was weak and under communism, they weren't producing enough food to feed the population. Now, Mao, Mao was kind of jealous of the fact that China couldn't produce the types of industrial goods or food like the United States could or like the British could. Um, he wants China to be able to produce uh, lots of industrial goods. However, China didn't at the time doesn't have the factories, doesn't have the factories to make the steel that you need to industrialize. So Mao gets this uh, ambitious idea. His idea is, you know what? We don't have the factories. We don't have the capital goods to produce all this steel and other stuff that we need to industrialize. We don't have the capital goods. Ah, but we can substitute capital goods. We can substitute human capital. We have lots of workers. So um, this bright idea was to replace factories with, well, more and more workers. So um, their plan then to produce all the steel was to have all the workers, when you're not at work, when you're at home, you're gonna be making steel by hand in your backyard. And in fact, if you look at uh, that picture over there in the corner, those are some clay furnaces that they started putting in everybody's backyard. And so when you aren't at work, you're at home making steel. Um, in addition to this plan to industrialize by having people making steel by hand, they also had a plan to uh, raise your agricultural production, to grow more food. And the plan was to use, uh, to collectivize the farms. So basically to make the farms more communist than they were before. And therefore they should be able to produce more food. By the way, if you uh, want to pause the video and take um, a look at this picture over here, this, uh, this is a picture from a propaganda poster at the time, really kind of captures some of the spirit, or at least some of the ambition of the Great Leap Forward. So as you probably could have guessed, the Great Leap Forward wasn't so much a Great Leap Forward so much as a Great Leap Failure. Um, as it turns out, no surprise, if you are, have a bunch of workers making steel in their backyard by hand, they end up making bad steel. So all the steel that got produced during the Great Leap Forward, they did produce steel, by the way. They actually did increase the production of steel. It's just it was all junk. It was all useless steel because you can't make good steel in your backyard. It doesn't work that way. Uh, and no surprise, when you apply more communist uh, production methods to making food, you end up producing less food. So the result here is not only does the economy not improve, we end up with at least 20 million people dying of starvation. It's a huge failure. All right, on to our second event here, which is the Cultural Revolution. So a little bit of background here. Remember that in China, um, Mao was respected. He was revered. He wasn't just viewed as, as their leader, as their dictator. He was, um, he was the founder. He was respected as the founder of Communist China, kind of, the, kind of like their George Washington. So he's a highly, highly, highly respected figure. Uh, in fact, uh, his portrait, is on display in every government building and every classroom. In fact, if you look at uh, the picture over there, uh, that's his portrait on, on display in huge form outside in Tiananmen Square. Um, children in school were taught to revere him and each kid had to carry around in their pocket uh, Mao's uh, little red book of his sayings and his teachings. Um, the fact of the matter is many Chinese people um, looked up to Mao like he was a god and therefore considered infallible, Couldn't, could never be wrong about anything. Problem is, after the, after the Great Leap Forward failed, um, well, remember, the Great Leap Forward, that was all Mao's idea. That was Mao's idea and it didn't work. Now, the average people weren't aware of how big of a failure it was, but the people in the government were. The people in the government knew about it. And a lot of the people in the government, well, some of them started to question Mao's infallibility. Some of them started to wonder if maybe, maybe Mao was getting a bit old and it was time for him to retire. You see though, Mao wasn't ready to retire though. 
he was ready to fight back. So Mao's got a problem. He needs to somehow seize control of the country again and recapture that enthusiasm, that, that revolutionary enthusiasm that put him in power in the first place. And so um, in order to do this, he's gonna need to find people who are loyal just to him, okay? He doesn't trust the people around him anymore. He's found out. He's found out that his uh, close government officials are talking about getting rid of him. So he needs people who he knows he can trust, people who are trained to worship him like a god. What he needs are the school kids. And so Mao ends up recruiting the teenagers. He recruits these loyal teenagers. He calls them the Red Guards. Uh, and using these Red Guards, he launches what becomes known as the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution. Now, the official purpose of the Cultural Revolution was to cleanse the country of any ideas, language, culture, or people who weren't communist enough. That's the official purpose. The real purpose, though, was to remove from the country people who weren't loyal to Mao. Now, the result of this is 10 years of oppression and terror. It's just an awful, awful uh, time period uh, in Chinese history. So during, uh, during this time, these Red Guards, they, they would arrest, they would humiliate, they would torture anyone who was accused by their neighbors or their coworkers of a large a variety of offenses. You could be um, making uncommunist or counter-revolutionary statements. You could be listening to the wrong kind of music, reading the wrong kinds of books, wearing the wrong kind of clothes, or, or simply saying or doing something that's disloyal to Mao. And so people were constantly having to look over their shoulders, worried that uh, a friend or coworker or, or family member was going to was going to report you. You constantly worried about what you said that it might be misinterpreted. Or by the way, if uh, someone in the Red Guards, you know, had a grudge against you, what's to stop them from just making stuff up? Um, and so this was a horrible, horrible, horrible time for the people of China. So the Cultural Revolution finally ends in 1976 when Mao dies. And soon after that and into the 80s, um, the, the new leaders of China, realizing how big of a failure the uh, Great Leap Forward War and the Cultural Revolution were started to shift China's economy away from command economy, working more towards a market economy. Now they don't they don't shift to democracy, but they are shifting the economy. And so um, by 1989, we're seeing a bit more economic freedom in China. At the same time, at the same time that this is taking place, um, we're seeing some things happening in Europe particularly in Eastern Europe. Uh, this is where we're seeing communism finally starting to fall in a few places. Um, time after time, uh, people start protesting against communist governments in Eastern Europe in the Soviet bloc, um, and they start demanding more political freedom and as a result end up gaining some political freedom. And we see this happening in Poland. We see this happening in Hungary, Czechoslovakia, East Germany. Not long after this, by the way, is when the Berlin Wall falls down. So this is, we're starting to see this pattern emerge in Europe of people protesting and demanding political freedom and, and getting uh, some political freedom. So um, a lot of people in China thought, hey, we can do the same thing. So um, especially college students, especially Chinese college students uh, think, you know what, if we protest, we put pressure on the government, we can get the government to grant us some political freedom as well. They were wrong. So this becomes known as the Tiananmen Square Massacre. So this starts in April of 1989. Um, they have college students in China start gathering in a place called Tiananmen Square. This is a big public area right in the capital of Beijing. Um, this eventually grows at times to have more than 100,000 participants uh, in Tiananmen Square, all demanding more political freedom. Um, their idea, hey, put enough pressure on the government, they'll, they'll give in and give us some freedom. Well, 
what the government actually does is they respond by sending in the army uh, where they uh, kill uh, and arrest thousands, thousands of these protesters in what ends up being a very bloody event that happens on June 3rd and 4th of that year, um, pretty well effectively slamming the door on any new political freedoms in China. And this is where China really diverges from uh, many of the other communist countries of the world. While communism fails uh, in Eastern Europe and in the Soviet Union and people end up getting uh, a certain amount of political freedom and democracy as a result, China, not so much, not so much.